So my name is Freeman Dyson. I'm an old physicist who has sit, been sitting around here for about 60 years. And since my memories go back a long time, I also like to look a long time into the future. And that's what we're going to be talking about. you had to sort of jump forward 50 years is there is there sort of one question you would like to see answered oh what about that well of course i'd like to see the aliens there's no doubt and, and, and it, will be, it will be tremendous to meet some aliens and see how the universe looks from their point of view that would be a great that would be a, a great moment whether we discover discover extraterrestrial life or not of course that's that's totally unpredictable and it's, if we discover it, it'll probably be by luck and just by happening to bump into something in the sky that we don't understand and turns out to be an alien. So, I mean, I hope very much that will happen, but I don't, I wouldn't bet, bet on it. Do you think it's more likely we'll find uh, some evidence of life within the solar system outside of the Earth or um, on an extrasolar planet? Well, I don't think it'll be on a planet at all. That's, of course, another thing I would like to say out loud. I mean, all this emphasis on planets, I think, is misguided. What life mostly needs is real estate, that is, area in which to spread out and live. And if you look at the real estate in the universe, most of it is on smaller objects, not on planets. And, and so there are mi millions and billions and trillions of small objects like comets and asteroids and dust grains and ro rocks and all kinds of th things floating around. And that's where most of the area actually is, whereas the amount of area on planets is quite small. So I would say if I were betting on where life is likely to be found, I would say probably not on planets. In the case of you know alien finding finding alien intelligence, I mean there is always the possibility that we'll just find microbes. Right? Oh, very much so. I mean it's it's very likely that life everywhere began with microbes, and it could very well have ended with microbes. It's, I mean, it's, it's to to make a multicellular creature it certainly took a long time on the earth. It go from one cell to a, an animal is a big jump and then from an animal to, to a human being is another big jump and so i would say if we in, in, encounter life it's most likely will be just microbes but uh, on the other hand if it happens to be aliens who already learned how to broadcast radio signals then they may be much easier to detect that would be something. Yeah, of course, this listening for radio signals is something that's been going on for 50 years and we've not found one. And so some people are discouraged about that. But I would say because data processing is getting better and better all the time, we still have a very good chance of finding radio signals. And I guess there's always, because this is impossible to predict, there's always the chance it could happen tomorrow. Absolutely. Okay. So when you, I guess, look to the future 50 years from now, um, what do you see as our, our place in the solar system? Are we still going to be mostly earthbound with a few robotic probes here and there? Well, I wouldn't say a few robotic probes here and there. I would say robotic probes everywhere. I mean, r robots are getting cheaper and cheaper and more and more capable. So that's just going to go ahead. There will probably be big, by that in 50 years, probably quite big industries in space with machines in charge. And then the uh, question is, of course, will people actually be doing anything out there, which is unpredictable because we don't, just don't know. It's, I, would, I would guess that in 50 years you won't see anything very exciting. In 100 years, maybe. I mean, the really exciting thing is when you have new societies in space 
where people go to live there permanently and live differently from the way we're living on Earth, that's going to take a longer time. I would say 100 years more, than, more likely than 50. What would drive us to do that? It's all a question of who wants to go and why. And I mean, I'm not driving anybody. I'm just saying somebody might like to go. And there's lots of things to do there. And who who wants to go and take the risks and, and spend the money, of course, remains to be seen. I was wondering if you had sort of a vision going forward the next 50 years for our energy future. Is there... What, what will it look like 50 years down the line? Well, certainly shale gas will be very large. It's much better distributed over the world than oil. And uh, there's, But there's also a lot of shale oil as well, deep down, so that that may be better distributed than the present-day oil fields. In, in any case, I mean, that's going to be undoubtedly in 50 years the, the main source of energy, it, it, very likely, but, but uh, in the meantime we may have cheap solar power, and I hope so, but that's not a sure thing. Uh, if, you, if we have cheap solar power, of course that uh, also is very well distributed, and so it means every country essentially has it. It's particularly good for the tropical countries. So with solar and shale gas, you, you're doing pretty well. And, and, and I think, of course, there are other contenders. There's always nuclear energy, which is not doing so well. Just 50 years ago, I believed that nuclear energy was the wave of the future, and that turned out to be wrong. And so you, you never know. Might be a big comeback for nuclear, but I doubt it. Are you hoping that we will reduce our carbon emissions significantly from where they are now? No, I don't think decarbonizing is that important. I mean, it, it's, it's, um, I like carbon dioxide. It's very good for plants. We know the sort of the non-climate effects of carbon dioxide are good. And they're very strong. It's good for the vegetation. It's good for the natural vegetation as well as for the farms. So it's, 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 it's essentially carbon dioxide is vital for food production, it's vital for wildlife. So for all sorts of reasons which have nothing to do with climate, it's good. But on the other hand, carbon dioxide also has effects on climate which may not be so good, but that's much less sure. The effects of carbon dioxide on climate are really very poorly understood. And of course there I'm in a minority. The experts all seem to think they understand it. I don't think they do. Uh, do you think that we'll, I guess, get a better understanding soon? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, climate is a very complicated story, and we may or may not un understand it better. I think the, uh, the main thing that's lacking at the moment is humility. The, the, so the climate experts have set themselves up as being the sort of guardians of the truth and, and they think they have the truth but and, and that's a dangerous situation. In terms of um, I guess policy, is there an argument to be made for just sort of hedging our bets and trying to reduce our, our carbon dioxide emissions as much as possible just in case the, the models turned out to be accurate? No, I don't think that's sensible I mean because it means you're doing huge damage to the environment which for non-climatic effects at the cost of large amounts of money and very likely getting no benefit at all. So I, I, I don't think it's a good bargain, no matter which way you look at it. What would the huge effects to the environment be? Well, simply producing less vegetation, making, making the, 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 the plants have to struggle for water more. I mean, carbon dioxide is a substitute for water. So if you have less carbon dioxide, the plants need more water in order to survive. So it produces deserts. And, and, and that has nothing to do with climate. It's just a biological effect. Are there any, um, I guess, technological developments that you found particularly surprising? 
of the course of your career? Well, of course, the big, big excitement has been the genome. In the, from, from a scientific point of view, that that's the, 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 the most amazing thing. Uh, I would say the big revolution in science that I see coming is understanding the brain. And that, of course, can have huge consequences, both uh, f for technology and also for medicine, and just for understanding ourselves. To record completely what's going on in a brain, you'd have to have something like a billion little transmitters in the brain, which you could imagine being some uh, tiny little object, sort of the size of a dust grain, which you somehow uh, float through the blood vessels into the brain. And, and then each of them is then a little radio transmitter, and it could collect information from about a million neurons. A neuron has a bandwidth of about a kilohertz, that's a thousand bits per second. And a transmitter, a microwave transmitter, has a bandwidth of about a gigahertz, which is a billion bits per second. So roughly speaking, one little microwave transmitter could transmit the information from a million neurons. So to do the entire brain, which is something like a trillion neurons, you you only need a, a, the order of a billion transmitters. And so the, the whole thing could perhaps work. I mean, it, it's a question whether you'd want to do that with a human being, but uh, at least you could do it with a monkey. And, and uh, so uh, you could maybe uh, then study in detail the processes going on in the brain in real time. So well, that's the kind of technology that's going to be available. If you can do that, then I would think it's very likely you really, you can really understand in, in, in some depth really how the brain is dealing with the senses and feelings and all the rest. We know that the brain is it's not just a computer. It does have emotions and feelings and all kinds of things we don't understand driving its behavior. And I think there's a good chance we could understand all that. Although it seems like there's a big gap between collecting all of that data and then somehow backing out from from those patterns, you know, all of these things like emotions or thoughts. In fact, that is the problem, yes, precisely. At the moment, we're drowning in information but lacking understanding. And that's, of course, will be even more so when we have this brain monitoring system. So you'll have huge amounts of information. The question is, can you understand what it's saying? And, and that's a, 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 a big and scary possibility that we, we would be in control of our own minds. And it's a very dangerous thing, of course. It could be very good or it could be very bad. So this, this might be a tough question to answer, but uh, are there any um, any technologies that are going to have a big impact 50 years from now, things that are are really going to to change our way of life? Yeah, well, of course, I will not... Uh, the, the, the really good ones are the, the ones that come by surprise. So they're obviously the ones I won't mention. So, but, uh, <laughs> but the, th the things I think of are mostly biotech that uh, I can imagine that in, in 50 years, Biotech would have reached the point where we can grow things rather than making them, so that a very large amount of our industry sort of will be converted to biotech instead of manufacturing things in, in the old-fashioned way, which has to be done in big quantities. You grow them so that all you need is just to write, write out the genetic instructions and the super chicken or whatever it is produces all the stuff that you want. So chairs and tables and windows and cups and saucers and cars and airplanes, whatever it is, maybe it could all be grown. And that will, of course, be a new art form. It will be a profound change in the way we do things. So this would be growing inert, inorganic objects using a biological system? It would be I mean, just as we use wood for making tables today. Wood is a biological material. 
but you just uh, you could do a lot more. You could have the table grow itself instead of having to be made. If I'm right, it will happen in about 50 years. And of course, it will be very helpful to the poor countries, which can all do biology. The, the in poor countries are not, not well supplied with minerals or not well supplied with fuel under present conditions. But everybody has sunlight and everybody has plants. And, and so that's what you need for doing biology. So I think it will be, in, in the end, a way of evening out the wealth. Of course, I don't know anything about the details. Yeah. But what I would hope it would be sort of a back to the village uh, situation where, especially in the poorer tropical countries, you have this huge migration of people out of the villages into the cities. The cities are horribly overcrowded and polluted, and the villages are deserted. That's a sort of pattern in many parts of the world. And I think that the, 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 the reason people go into the cities, of course, is because the jobs are in the cities. There are no jobs in the villages. I think this kind of biotech might enable people to move back to the villages so the villages would become gentrified and, and would be nice places to live. And you could also have jobs in the villages. I mean, this is roughly what's happened already in Western Europe and my home country of England. So the villages are still beautiful the way they always have been. But the people who live in the villages are not farmers anymore. The people who live in the villages now are stockbrokers and bankers. And they live in the villages because that's a nice way to live. And I hope it'll be the same in a country like China if you want to just wait 50 years. And then I, I just had a sort of meta question, which was just, um, we've been talking a lot about sort of the far future. Um, and I know you've written before that, you know, it's better to be wrong than to be vague. But, um, you know, does it, is it at all strange to predict, to, to sort of offer up these predictions so far into the future? Well, I think it's fine. I mean, the point about a prediction is not that it's true. Prediction is just either a warning or a hope. I mean, either one or the other. But it, it's, it's, it, it doesn't have much to do with truth. So, but, so predictions should never claim to be true. But you can, but you can sort of claim that there are possibilities, that there's something you ought to think about. Mm -hmm.